What's going on, YouTube family? Tio here, Simplistic Fishing, back at you tonight to talk to you a little bit about some Bass Fishing 101. So last time we talked, I was talking to you about frog fishing. Hopefully you went out and you, you checked your frog gear and you made sure you had the right gear on and all that good stuff. So hopefully you're ready to go there. The problem is my GoPro decided to tank on me and my other camera is just not nearly as good. So I got to do some upgrades to my cameras. Uh, I'm working on that and didn't know my GoPro was going to crash out on me like that. So the last couple of days I've been screwing around with it and never did get it fixed. So it's time to get a new one. But I did want to go back and circle back with you about the frog fishing. So tonight I'm going to share some links in the description. You'll see them in there to some really good YouTube videos on how to do the frog fishing. And one of them is from Tactical Bass and that really talks about how to walk the frog. And I think it's one of the best videos that's out there on how to walk the frog. And I'm not sure that I could do it any better. So I'm just going to share that with you guys. And we'll talk to you about, talk about that here in just a minute. Some of the other videos I want you guys to check out on frog fishing. And then we're going to switch over and I want to talk to you about this fall transition that we're in because this is the time of year for me when things used to get really, really tough and they still are tough, uh, but they used to get so tough. I mean, it was basically, you know, days of zero fish, not catching anything at all. And so if you're experiencing that at this time right now, I think this video is really going to help you out. I'm going to help hopefully put you on some fish or at least get you started in the right direction. Stick around. I got some good stuff for you. Let's go ahead and jump into this thing. Let's talk about first the frog fishing, and then we're going to immediately jump over to the uh, to the fall transition. But the last video that we talked about, and if you missed that one, just click the link up at the top. It's one of those two fingers. It's going to be up there somewhere. That'll take you to that frog fishing video where we talked about the different styles of frogs and how to how to walk them and all that good stuff, or not how to walk them, but how to use them. And then we were going to transition over before the cameras broke to talk to you about actually how to walk a frog. But unfortunately. They broke. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put you guys on some really good videos. So look at the description for this video. Look in the description. There's going to be, let's see, there's going to be five different video links that are going to be in there. I'm going to be looking to my side here. So my apologies. I don't want to screw this one up for you, but I've got a couple different ones in there for you. I really want you to check out the first one that we're going to look at. This one is actually going to be called Frog Fishing, Everything You Need to Know. And this is by Tactical Bassin. So click that link. That one's perfect. It discusses all the frogs, kind of similar uh, to kind of what I discussed for you. Mine's probably a little bit more general, a little bit more local to our area, but that is a excellent frog fishing video if you've not watched it before or if you're new to frogging. Then we have another one that's in there, the second one that I want you to go look at, and this is gonna be one that's really gonna teach you about how to actually walk the frog. And if you're, you're also wanting to learn how to walk the dog, you've heard walk the dog as well, um, you know, you do that with the frog, but you also do that with spooks, those top water baits where they're just, you know, swishing back and forth. This is a great video for you to watch too, because it will help you with those top waters and also with the frogs. This one is actually called Bass Fishing, How to Walk a Frog, and it's by Tactical Bass. And again, so go out, click that link. That one's going to take you there. Thank you guys going to like that. I mean, subscribe to this guy's channel. It's phenomenal information, bass fishing information. And then a couple more links that I want you to check out, um, kind of maybe just different approaches uh, to it, but they're also really good, uh, really good channels to go out and watch to learn more about bass fishing. Uh, here they are. I'm going to read them off to you real quick. The first one that I want you guys to check out is going to be the last frog fishing video that you'll ever need. Uh, it's frog fishing tips. I believe that one is actually by... Tyler's Real Fishing. So go out there, check it out. Um, Tyler's actually local, not local, but uh, very close to us. Um, he actually bought, we actually bought, uh, my friend actually bought Tyler's Real Fishing's old boat. So um, had some contact with him. He's a great guy. So go out, check out his videos. Also, uh, Stop Fishing Frog Like This. This is done by Bass Fishing HQ. This guy's name's Tyler as well. We must. Tyler must be a great name for fishing. So anyways, Bass Fishing HQ gives me a lot of good information. Even though I'm an experienced angler, I love to watch these guys and learn from them. Everyone has their own techniques on ways to do things, and this is really how you're going to learn how to fish. So don't just watch my videos, which hopefully you're not just watching my videos. That would be crazy. Uh, but go out and watch some of these other ones. Tactical Bass is excellent. Bass Fishing HQ is good. Uh, there's a lot of them out there. Intuitive angling is good. 
uh, informative fishermen's grades. So you've got a lot of them that are out there. I could probably go on with a, a list of the ones that I have out there, but uh, there are just some really, really good ones out there. And maybe one day I'll just do a video for you guys just on the bass fishing videos that uh, or channels that I watch. And then you guys can share with me what you watch and maybe we can get a pretty good collection. So anyways, I'm still rumbling, but we've got one more video that I want to talk to you guys about. And this one to me was excellent, especially if you're an advanced frog fisherman and you want to start kind of tweaking with the lures a little bit, doing some, some different things. This one is actually called Advanced Frog Fishing Modifications and it's by Fletcher Shyrock. That is excellent, is probably one of the coolest little uh, frog fishing videos I've seen, especially uh, me, you know me, I love to frog fish. So I don't really need to be taught how to walk a frog. I've been doing that for years, but I do need to be taught all the different cool things I can do with my frog to make it more powerful, uh, to make it present differently, all those things. So go out and check out his video. Uh, it's great. He's also got a good channel. That guy is excellent at shallow water fishing and he's probably one of the best frog fishing uh, fishermen that are out there on the elite circuit. So with all that, let's go ahead and switch over and let's talk about this fall transition. So here we are, we're in late fall, it's November 15th. Um, the fishing has really been, you know, it's been, it's been a challenge here the last couple of days. I mean, you guys know my boat was in the shop for that great fall feeding time. So for five weeks there when fishing was probably as good as it was going to get besides springtime, I was not on the water fishing, unfortunately. I was sitting at home uh, begging that my boat get out of the shop, but the boat did get out of the shop. So we went back on the lot water. And by the time really that I got back to fishing, the water temps had dropped down to about 60 degrees right around in there. And so in my experience, and this is where we're probably gonna have some, some arguments out there, but in my experience, when the water temperature starts to get around 60, that's when things start getting difficult. And it's weird because I read, uh, I read you know, a lot of articles on Bassmasters and stuff like that. And they all say that 60 is a prime time uh, to be catching fish. You know, we should be catching a ton of fish when the, the fish are very active, they're very aggressive, um, you know, and so it makes you kind of scratch your head. And you're like, why, why am I struggling when all the elites are saying this is some of the best times to be fishing? So through trial and error and many, many years of fishing, I think I may have finally cracked the nut and uh, LiveScope has really helped me do this. And so I wanted to explain to you guys what I'm seeing, my experience out here. Now this can be different, especially if you live up north, 60 degrees up north might be really warm water for those bass and maybe they're accustomed to it. But in my experience here in North Texas, when that water gets 60 degrees or below, this change starts to happen. And if you're missing it, you're gonna, you're just not gonna catch very many fish. It's gonna be few and far between, one here, one there, and you're not really gonna be able to pick up very much uh, in regards to tournaments. So what I'm basically seeing, and, and it goes along with the articles, it's just, it seems like my temperature scale is just about five degrees different. So if they say, you know, they're gonna start spawning when it's 50 degrees, it's like, I start seeing it when it's more like 55. Or if they say the fall transition starts when the water's at 65, I kind of start seeing it when it's 70. Now, maybe I'm just ahead of the curve, or just a dumb fisherman. I don't know, but that's my experience. So I want to share that with you guys. So I go out, I'm fishing this weekend. Uh, I fished on Thursday on Veterans Day out on Hubbard. And then we fished uh, Saturday. We pre-fished for the, the victory tournament or I pre-fished for the victory tournament. Um, and then Sunday, Landon joined me for the victory tournament. We only had eight boats in that tournament, but we ended up winning the tournament. And we won the tournament with 12 pounds and I think 49 ounces or 94 ounces, I keep getting the numbers mixed up, but we did win the tournament, which that's not a lot of weight to win a tournament on. Yes, we only had eight boats, but that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what we've been seeing. But I think we're going to crack that nut. I think we're going to be able to get a lot more than just 13 pounds the next time we go out. We've just had to kind of figure it out. It's taken us a while to figure it out. So what we did figure out is obviously it's just like everyone else says, the bass are active. Yeah, they're definitely active and they're definitely feeding. Even though our water temperature is 60 and 59 degrees, they're still very active. What we've noticed on the live scope is that we've really got to pay attention to where those shad are. So where the balls of shad are on your graphs is about as important as anything right now. I mean, you, you just, you've got to dial that in. You've got to figure that out. You've got to figure out where those shad balls are. They're all pretty much consistent. They're either going to be in like five to 10 foot of water zero to five foot of water or on those really sunny days what we're seeing sunny and calm days 
is that they'll go from up there, they'll shift down just a little bit more. And as they shift down, the bass don't stay right with them, right? So if your shad are at five foot, your bass are probably at 10 foot. And if your shad are at 10 foot, your bass are probably at like 15, 20 foot. So they stay right underneath it and you'll see them on the pan ops. They'll come up and they'll attack them. And rarely do you see a bass come down from the top and attack a, 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 you know, a bait school. It just doesn't happen. So if you're looking at for the bait schools, figure out where they are, find that depth and find kind of the average depth and fish just below that. And so I think that's been probably my biggest challenge throughout my fishing time that I've had on the water is that I like to slow fish, you know, I like fishing jigs, I like fishing shaky heads. Um, I also like power fishing too. I like fishing the moving baits, but all the baits that I throw, when I think about it, other than a jerk bait, they all just dive deep, right? They either dive deep or they stay on the bottom. And if I'm looking at this pan optics, even on the sunny days, the sunny and really calm days, we had one of those uh, this weekend and it did, it changed the way the fishing was. We had to fish for them just a little bit differently because the moving bait was off. They just would not bite it. They would only bite the moving bait when we had a little bit of wind. If we get a little bit of ripple on the water or get some really good wind, the moving bait was back on. But when the moving bait was off, the wind was off um, and it kind of went hand in hand. But the bass, what we were seeing on the live scope is let's say that this is the bottom of the lake. On the sunny days, the bass were probably like three or four feet off the bottom. They were about right here. On the windy days, the bass were way up here, up in the water column at like five to 10 feet. I mean, they were way up high, but seriously, if the wind died, they would just move down. If the wind picked up, they would move back up and the shad would do the same thing. They would just kind of move up and down. So what I'm trying to get at is that you really got to pay attention to those shad because they're going to tell you where the bass are. But the trick here is that the reason why people think this is a really difficult time to fish, and even myself included, is that if you don't know that depth, if you're not paying attention to your graphs on where those bait schools are, then it is going to be really, really hard. Because let's say that you go out there, even on a sunny clear blue sky day you're like okay this guy has told me and so does everybody else on youtube and everywhere else says you gotta fish slow on sunny calm days well yes but there's always a but right if you're fishing a jig and maybe you don't you're not hopping it so if you're if you're not hopping that jig up and getting it up in the water column and you're just dragging it straight on the bottom think about it your bass are here they're at three to four foot they're just hovering. They're suspending just barely over the, the bottom, but far enough over the bottom where you're just you're just fishing underneath them the entire time. You're just you're literally fishing. There's fish right there for you to catch, and you're missing them because you're fishing the slow bait that pretty much everybody thinks you should fish, right? The jigs, the Texas rig worms, all those things that you drag. But I got a secret for you. On those sunny days, in this time of year especially, you want to hop stuff. And the reason why you want to hop it is because when you hop it, right, you're popping it up to three or four foot and it's dropping down. And that bass is say here at three foot, you hop it up at four foot, he swims by and boom, it's right in front of his face, right? Hop it up. It's right in front of his face. That is critical right now. Absolutely critical. If you're fishing that slow moving bottom stuff, that's just dragging along the bottom, you're literally fishing underneath the fish. So this is the hard time because we got the suspending fish. If you don't have the electronics, you're going to struggle. Um, but I think most of you guys watching this channel do have the electronics. Even if you don't have pan optics, you don't need pan optics. Just pay attention to your 2D. Find out where those bait schools are and pay attention to those. And that is going to help you out a lot. So a couple more things that I want to talk to you guys about as we're uh, going through this discussion. You know, the bass do like to suspend. So if they're suspending, you're thinking, okay, where, where are these fish suspending at? Now on Hubbard, we basically just have this bowl. We got some timber and stuff like that, but overall it's just this big bowl. We don't have a lot of channels and coves and stuff like that. So it's like, where, where am I going to go find these guys at with the, you know, where they're uh, suspending? Well, first off, and most importantly, is going to be bridges. Bridges are key right now. They're going to be key for you pretty much until it gets warm again. You want to fish around the bridges. Bridges are key. They collect the crappie and all of that, a lot of bait fish, and obviously that brings out the bass. But that doesn't mean that you just fish the bridge pillars that are right there by the riprap, you know, in five or 10 foot of water, because that's what you're comfortable with. And that's what you can throw your Texas rig out and you can drag it across the rocks and you can feel like you're fishing, but you're not going to catch very much. 
Um, what you need to do is you need to back off a little bit, especially if there's a creek channel running through that bridge. That's that's key as well. Make sure there's a creek channel or a creek or something or a river running underneath that bridge and get closer to that creek channel. Yeah, you're going to be out in 20 or 30 foot of water, but those bass are still only in five or 10 foot of water. You just got to use the right baits to get them. Um, and then if they're down there further on bottom, that's usually when you can move a little bit further in. They're not going to be as far. If they're if they're lower, closer to the bottom, they're maybe not going to be as far out. So move in a couple pillars and see if you can find them there. So it's really all about your electronics here. But pay attention to the uh, to the graphs. That's going to be key. Pay attention to the schools of bait. The other area that you want to focus on is going to be standing timber off of points. So if you can find standing timber off of points, that's going to be huge. I got a couple examples out here for you guys for uh, standing timber off points. I believe I put one out there for you guys on a fork for the bridges. We've also got standing timber. I found some on Lake Louisville. I found some on Lake Levon. Uh, so you'll see just a couple of different images that I put out here for you for uh, from web app. Navy Onyx it just kind of shows you what I'm talking about. So you'll see the bridges here. And then on the next images that you're going to see, this is going to be all of your uh, your flooded timber, just some kind of examples of different lakes. And I'll put the little icon down there at the bottom uh, as we're looking through there, so it'll tell you what those lakes are. So standing timber, what do I mean by it? Well, standing timber basically is flooded timber. But the main thing that you're looking at here, if you're starting to figure it out, is that we just went from uh, you know, we talked about going shallow and then from shallow, they went to these brush piles, right? Brush piles are, are a little bit further on the bottom, um, a little bit further out, not too much further up, just a little bit further out in the brush piles. That was kind of the thing. And then now they've kind of left these brush piles and you're like, where did they go? They all went suspended. They're all chasing these bass, not all of them, but the majority of them. And the standing timber is just like that bridge column, right? It's straight up and down. So what we're looking for uh, when we're looking for suspending bass as they still relate to cover um, that cover being the bridge pillar pillar or being the uh, the standing timber they're still going to relate to it they're going to suck up really close to it but they're going to suspend so instead of setting down on the brush piles or setting down on the rock piles now they're up in these trees and the on these bridge pillars and they're a lot higher than what we're accustomed to so uh, definitely go out there you know, pay attention to that and really keep that in mind right now. And I think that's going to help you guys out a ton. So before we finish up this video, I know it's kind of long here, about 15 minutes. One more thing I want to talk to you guys about, and that's going to be about what baits you need to be throwing. Because uh, as I mentioned before, if you're throwing the wrong thing, you're going to have some really tough days out there. But if you're throwing the right thing, you might not have a really good time. So obviously crankbaits are huge. Uh, this is the time of year, though, when you don't want to be fooled by the crankbait. So we're used to being taught that the crankbaits need to go down and deflect off of cover, um, that that's key. They got to be hitting the bottom. You got to be grinding away. That's how you're going to catch the bass. And yes, you're going to catch some bass doing that this time of year. That thing's going to deflect up and things like that. But this is the time of year when you can actually throw a crankbait out there and not make any contact with anything, uh, maybe other than the bridge pillars and things like that bouncing off of those. Um, but this is the time of year when you can basically generate strikes by just running that crankbait through the water column. But the key there is, and again, here I am with buds, you want to do the burn, burn, burn pause that, you know, the tactical bass and talks about all the time. So if you're not hitting cover, you want to make it look like you're hitting cover or you're at least stuttering that bait. So you're going to wind it really, really fast and then pause it. And then wind it, pause it, wind it, and pause it. That's going to generate you the strikes. You are going to catch some fish if you're just throwing it out there and you're hitting that right depth and you're just reeling it through. But you're going to get a lot more if you're being a little more uh, erratic with the way that you're moving your baits. So that's number one, or maybe not number one, but that's one bait that you could really focus in on, especially if maybe you don't have the equipment for the A rigs and all that. Go out, get you some crank baits. You know, you want to get one that dives five foot, get you one that dives 10 foot and then get you one that dives 15 to 20 foot. And that'll cover you for all the different uh, depths that you need to be looking at. Then find the shad. Once you find the shad or the bait schools, then go about five feet below them and then just try work on that. And I think that's gonna really help you guys out. The next thing would be rattle traps, rattle traps or lipless crankbaits. You guys have heard me talk about those a lot. This is the time of year to be throwing them because they're targeting suspended bass. Um, so you can chuck those things a mile, right? You can throw them around riprap as well. So this is the time of year when if you can't, maybe you don't have bridges or timber, go find some riprap, some rock, some really steeper rock 
uh, preferably if you can find that that's going to be a really good area for you guys to fish and rock around points and stuff like that but maybe you don't even have that maybe you just have points well points are great places to throw your rattle traps and you can adjust your depth by just throwing it out and counting it down and figuring out how many seconds it takes for each foot or however many feet it can go each second until it hits the bottom and if you do that then find out where those those you know bait schools are let's say that they're in five foot well i'm going to count down my rattle trap to maybe seven to ten foot and then i'm going to start retrie retrieving it and try to keep it consistent right around that depth again pausing it reeling it in pausing it things like that that's going to help you out too that's a totally different way to do the trap you know you're used to throwing that lipless crankbait uh, or that rattle trap out in grass and burning it and ripping it out. But this is a different way to do it. And you can definitely catch some fish doing that with the, uh, the rattle traps. Both of those are pretty easy. Spinner baits too. Get the spinner baits with the willow leaves, the bigger ones. Um, you know, don't, don't go huge spinner bait yet because we don't need to get down deep, right? We're still trying to stay mid water, water column. So you're probably thinking like three eighths ounce, half ounce spinner baits. Go out and get you some of those. Get you some white ones with some chartreuse on them, especially if you're in this North Texas area with this brown colored water. Get you some chartreuse uh, spinner baits. That'll help you out as well. You can adjust the depth with those. That's what's the key is just adjusting the depth to find them. And then last but not least, uh, obviously, well, I guess I got two more um, or three more really. Dang, I just can't. I keep going on. So three more would be the next one would be a rigs uh, alabama rigs now if you do not have the rod setup for alabama rigs don't just don't even do it you're just going to waste your money uh i'll talk to you guys about a rigs and how to use them and and we are going to have some video once again my youtube fix or my gopro fix uh, we're going to have some video on how to do the alabama rig as well but that is a killer killer tool to use right now it takes an investment it's like 20 bucks for the stupid setup and then probably, you know, if you get the right setup, my setup cost me like five or $600 for my rod and reel. So I'm literally five or $600 into this setup just to throw a rigs, but I start throwing a rigs right now and I won't quit throwing them until springtime. So it's something that I throw a lot, uh, especially in the winter time. So I want to talk to you guys about that. That is the most effective bait that you can be throwing right now. Hands down, there's nothing better. All right. So on those days though, when it gets, uh, you know, calm. So it's really calm. You're like, okay, what do I throw? Well, real quick, going back, if it's windy, don't forget about the swim baits too. Swim baits work as well, but a rigs are just a whole bunch of swim baits. So anyways, let's switch back over. All right. Slow, calm days. What do we do? I hate to say it. It hurts my heart because I do not like fishy with it, but there's times a year when you just got to do it. And that's a drop shot. Uh, a drop shot is key here. So let's say that you don't have those moving baits uh, available to you, or maybe you just don't feel comfortable with doing that, or maybe it's a sunny, clear day, blue skies, and you're not sure what you should throw. The drop shot is key. If you guys aren't familiar with how to throw a drop shot, you've got to go learn, get you a spinning setup, uh, and then get you a drop shot. You definitely want this. And the reason for the drop shot is because if you look at the weight, the weight's going to be, say, like right here, and your worm is going to be way up here. And if you remember when we were talking about earlier about those bait schools, uh, you know, and how they relate to the bait schools. If the bait schools shift down, the bass shift down, but they don't shift to the bottom. They shift just off the bottom. Well, look where your worm's at. Your worm's right here. And here's Mr. Bass coming along. <laughs> and there you go. You got yourself a hookup. So drop shots are key right now. Make sure you're keeping that bait up off the bottom. So your drop shot weight, if it's touching the bottom, you want to make sure you get enough leader line to where you're bringing that bait plenty far off the bottom. If you're not touching the bottom, then that's where you can just really, you know, drop it down, count how long it takes to go to the bottom, figure out what depth you need to be fishing at, and then fish right at that depth. Dangle your little worm there, dangle a little minnow there, whatever it is that you have. And I think you're going to have a lot more success doing that. Again, that's going to be all about the bait fish and how the fish are positioning. That is critical uh, on the drop shot. Last two things I want to talk to you guys about are two things that we had some success with this weekend um, that kind of helped us out, especially on those calm days. One is a jig, just a regular round headed jig. Uh, not even sure what kind of jig I was throwing, but it was definitely it was a green uh, pattern uh, or green color um, and really just throwing that thing around. And the key to that was not dragging it. Right. A lot of times you guys will see me on the videos and I'm just dragging it to the side and then I'm reeling it in, dragging it to the side. Or you'll see me fishing it like this, where I'm just dragging it up on top of the rocks and letting it fall. 
but this is different. This is in this time of year, this is when you really got to pop it. So get you one that's a little bit lighter that you can pop. Uh, I think I was throwing a half ounce, maybe even a three eighths ounce. Uh, I think it was a half ounce, but I throw that out there, let it go all the way to the bottom. Jig trailer on it had some pretty good little flapper, so it got some attention. And then I would fish it almost like you would fish a spoon. So I'd pop it really hard, pop it all the way off the ground, and then let it come back down. And then I'd pop it back on slack line again and let it come back down. And as I would get my bites, I would not feel them until the I would actually, the jig would come down. I think they were biting the jig on the fall. And then I wouldn't even feel the bite. I would just see my line start to move. And that was when I reeled down and set the hook. It's a difficult bite to get. Uh, but you can definitely get it. You got to pop that jig though. That's the key is you got to pop it because again, we're talking about where those bass are positioned, right? They're on the bottom. They're not on the bottom. They're just a little bit up off the bottom so that you don't want that jig going underneath them. You want that jig basically popping up and falling down in front of their face so they can attack it. Same thing. Last one I want to talk to you guys about is that shaky head. We've talked about it a ton. It's a lifesaver. It's something that you need to get comfortable throwing. You don't want to drag it. You can drag a shaky head just like you know you do the jig. You don't want to drag it here. You want to get you something uh, that has a little bit of you know tails on it or something that wiggles a lot, something that's going to get their attention. And you want to go out there and you literally want to do the popping that we talked about a lot of times. You're going to pop it, let it fall to the ground, let it stay on a little bit of slack line, pop it again, and just keep working that back. And that is when you're going to get your bites. You're going to get your bite on the fall. Some other things you could use too is you could go out there and use a spoon. I'm just not a big spoon fisherman, but uh, you could definitely do that. And jerk baits work well too, especially during this time of year and as we get colder. But in our area, for whatever reason, for me, jerk baits just aren't as good as they were, say, up in Missouri where we had the clear water. So anyways, guys, this was a super long video, so I apologize for that. But I'm hoping that this is going to help you guys find some fish, especially during this fall time of year. Because if you can get on them and figure out those patterns and figure out where those fish are, you can have some really good days out there and you can put the hurt on some people in the turnings. So until next time, guys, I hope you catch your PB. Take care.